Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be getting started in just a minute or two. If you want to play along with us in one of Holly's activities today, there are some ingredients um, on your screen. So if you want to grab those, if you want to be able to play along later on in our webinar. We'll be getting started in just about one minute. All right, let's get going. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kathy Trainer, and I will be hosting um, Holly's webinar this afternoon. Um, this is the first in Becker's series of seasonal science webinars. So those of you who have joined us before um, are familiar with Holly and all her great and enjoyable activities. So we get another great opportunity with Holly this afternoon. Um, so I am part of the education team here at Becker's, and we are very excited to be um, presenting this webinar today. And what a great fall day to be able to have this webinar. Outside my window, the sun is shining, the sky is blue, the leaves are yellow orange. It is just a magnificent time of year. And what a great day to start this. Um, so if you uh, want to grab your last supplies before we get started, that would be great. If not, um, this will all be available to you later, so you can um, check it out later. Uh, a little housekeeping items. Um, yes, you will have a, uh, you will get a professional development certificate uh, that will be emailed to you. Um, and Terry was gracious enough to uh, design it for us. And the email address that you use to register will, will, is where it will be sent to you. Uh, today's uh, presentation is in webinar format, so you are muted. Um, if you have questions, um, you can post them in the, the Q&A box. Um, and Terry and Marilyn are graciously going to be answering questions uh, during uh, the webinar for that. Um, if you do them in the chat, we, they kind of get lost. Um, so question and answer box is great for that. Uh, a video recording of today's webinar as, long as, as well as the step-by-step -step instructions for the activities, some book recommendations, and a resource list will be made available to you after uh, today's presentation. The recording is also going to be available on Becker's YouTube page um, and Becker's website in their uh, resource cafe. Um, Holly has some uh, polls for us today to see just how scientific um, and excited you are about fall. So uh, we welcome you to participate in the polls um, so that you can, that's one way you can participate. Um, and it's so great as I was watching everyone sign in, we have folks from everywhere in the country pretty much. Uh, California's um, in the house today, as well as Florida. So it's, can be very interesting to see the difference between the Florida folks and California. Um, and we have the privilege of being in the mid-Atlantic states where we get to see all four seasons. Um, so a little bit about Holly. Um, I'll tell you a little bit and then Holly can tell you even more about herself. So Holly is a certified uh, K through eight uh, elementary teacher. Um, she has 15 years working at the Academy of Natural Sciences right here in the Philadelphia area, which is a great um, place to, to really explore um, science. Um, and she's also a, a reading specialist with Achieve Now, which is a Philadelphia nonprofit that provides literacy support for uh, public school children in grades, in grades three through uh, kindergarten through third grade. Um, Holly is very versed in STEAM and STEM and she loves to read books, um, books about science especially. And nature is one of Holly's favorite topics. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Holly. And for everyone, please enjoy this afternoon. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. That was a lovely introduction. Hello, everyone. I saw some familiar names there in our chat from our other webinar series. So I'm really excited to see you again. Um, so thanks for joining us. And we're gonna talk about fall today. So you can see all those pictures on there on the screen of, uh, of all the things that I've done while I was working at the museum. I love animals and I love nature, as Kathy mentioned before. So we're gonna talk a lot about how we can really get into um, um, those science skills using uh, fall animals and plants this uh, webinar. All right, so here's our first poll. I want to know how comfortable you are teaching science in your classroom. Is it something you dread? Is it something you look forward to? So go ahead and fill that out because that's a really big indication. Um, I've, I've uh, learned with a lot of our uh, preschool teachers is sometimes they're scared to teach science. And I'm here to tell you, there is nothing to be afraid of, okay? We're going to learn a lot while we're here together, and I'm going to give you permission right now to be wrong. And that's what I want you to do with your students, too. I want, to, I want you to give your students permission to be wrong, because in science, when we're wrong, we learn lots of stuff together. I'm also going to give you the permission to say, I don't know, and that's okay, too. That's what scientists do all the time. I don't know, but I want to find out. So nothing to be afraid of. So go ahead and fill that out and we'll move on here. I just wanna hear from everybody what your comfort level is. All right, so a lot of standards there. What I love about the preschool standards for science is that they're, um, <laughs> they're sort of vague. Now I know that sounds like not a great thing, but for me, science in early education is uh, less about specific content points and more about loving science and learning the skills necessary to be a really good scientist. So if you need to uh, perfectly align it to a standard, here they are, there's our results. Okay, nobody hates it. Oh, that's fantastic news. I'm glad nobody hates it. <laughs> so thank you for filling out that first poll for me. That's great news. All right, so let's, oops. <laughs> of course, there's a little, little mistake there on my very first slide, but that's okay because scientists make mistakes all the time. All right, so in preschool, like I said, we're not really talking about content. As they get older, it's gonna be really important to sort of learn the specifics of different science topics. When we're talking early childhood, we're really just getting everyone excited about the process of science. So making observations is huge. So I've taught um, everyone from toddlers all the way up to retirees science. And what this is that after kindergarten, basically, all of the students I've worked with have stopped using their senses. And it's a bummer because in science, you need to use your senses to make observations. So let's get that going in preschool. I know you guys are already doing a lot of um, senses work with your students. So using their five senses to explore the world around them. But we wanna make sure that it's framed within science because we want them to keep using their senses as they get older. And then the next most important thing is asking questions. Preschoolers are not at a, uh, not at a loss for questions ever. But what's really important when they're younger is taking those questions and reworking them so they become something they can test or something they can learn more about. So asking questions and making observations, those are the two biggies. That's what we're looking at when we're talking about science in early elementary. You're already doing this in your classroom. So if you don't think you're a science teacher, you are 100% a science teacher because those are the two most important skills and they fill a preschool classroom. So you are already a fantastic science teacher. So the other things that, that um, can uh, be fostered through early uh, science in the early elementary, I mean the early childhood classroom, lots of things. Cause and effect, following directions, order of operations, back Background. Now see, I put background knowledge acquisition last because in my mind, honestly, even though I spent my whole life giving out those little bits of knowledge um, about science, that to me is probably the least important thing um, in early elementary science, or in early uh, childhood science, because really we're looking at the skills and the processes and the love of the natural world. So those are the things we really want to focus on. 
All right, we're gonna talk dissections. <laughs> so I have another poll for you because when I say the word dissection, what do you think of? Have you dissected anything with your students in your classroom? Now, it doesn't have to be a frog or any of those other things that you may have done uh, in high school, but um, dissection, when I say dissection, I mean basically pull apart a hole and look at its pieces, okay? So it doesn't have to be anything, um, you know, potentially scary like the frogs, but it could be something as simple as an apple or a pumpkin or a flower. So just let me know if those are things that you have done in your classroom so I know how far or how deep to go into my discussion about dissections. All right, let's talk fall dissections. So again, I'm, I'm talking about breaking something open and looking at what, what's inside of it. So you, of course, are using all of your senses. Here's the deal. Now, I've heard this from teachers and I get it. Pulling something apart and looking at the inside gets messy. And it's going to be messy. And I've seen people do dissections in baggies and, and gloves. And, and if that is what you need to do to, to, to get your dissections rolling, fantastic but the mess is part of the learning. All right, so I see our poll results here. Okay, so some of you have done some dissecting in your classrooms and some of you do it all the time. That's fantastic news. So hopefully I'll be able to show you some things today to up your game on your dissections in your classroom. And for those of you who are a little afraid of it or don't do it as often, hopefully it's something you're gonna continue to use a little bit more. All right, um, so when I was talking about using your senses, it, it's hard to use your sense of touch and your sense of smell. And I know sense of taste becomes a little um, uh, difficult in the preschool classroom because oftentimes we don't want them to put things inside their mouths, but you really can't get full observations unless you're allowing the students to really get in there and really get messy. So don't be afraid of the mess is, is, is what I'm, I'm hoping you pull away from that. You can practice using tools. Now, as they get older, the tools will get sharper and, and more involved. <laughs> so we're not talking scalpels and those sorts of things. But as your students get older, I would introduce things like scissors and um, toothpicks and, and things that are, that are a little sharper to allow them to pull things apart. Um, but all tools, anything can be a tool for dissection, depending on what you're dissecting. But this is a great opportunity to practice those magnifying glasses, to practice with tweezers, to practice um, using things like journals and notebooks, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And of course, making predictions. If you're not making predictions the whole time you're uh, dissecting something, you're missing some really important information. And the important thing is to go back and check those predictions. Now, at the beginning, I gave you permission to be wrong, and it's important you give your students permission to be wrong too, so that they're not afraid to make those predictions, okay? It's really, really important that they're allowed to make predictions that might be wrong, because that's when the best science happens, when you're testing something that might be wrong. And then making comparisons, sorting and arranging. Now that is a huge skill, as you all know, for our students to really, um, to, to latch onto in these preschool years. And you can give them a really solid base in these skills through dissections. All right, so what can you dissect in the fall? There's lots of things. I'm sure that we have folks who have dissected apples and pumpkins and all that great stuff in, in, in uh, their classroom. And so much can be learned from dissecting those particular things. Um, but I want you to think about dissections, not only dissecting single objects or, or, or organisms, okay? You can dissect piles of things. Now I know that sounds more like sorting, and it is sorting because dissection generally ends up being comparing and, so, and sorting all the time. But if we frame it as scientists need to be really good at sorting through things to learn as much as they can about them, you're going to really do your students a big service as they get older and, and, and do sort of more involved science. So some of my favorite dissections with um, uh, preschoolers is dirt. I know it sounds silly. But a pile of dirt, like real dirt, not potting soil or anything that's been like sanitized or pretty, um, just like big old scoop of dirt with everything in it, that's a really good dissection. Because you don't have to worry about cutting and, and it, there's no sort of dangerous bits to it. Um, and there's so much. And it's something they've 
seen forever, but they haven't actually explored and dug into. So when you think about things to dissect, it doesn't have to be discrete individual organisms. Think about um, expanding your idea of what you're dissecting in your classroom. Now, we can all cut open a pumpkin and we can look inside and the internet is filled with lovely diagrams of what a pumpkin looks like inside. And so it's really easy to, to sort of um, meet out what all the different parts of our pumpkin are when you're dissecting it. And that's fantastic. And it's definitely something you should do. But I want to try to expand that idea a little bit more. So we're, we're not just focusing on sort of internal structures and things like that, because ultimately, it doesn't really matter if a preschooler knows why pumpkins have tendrils on them, what the purpose of them is. Um, but if they learn how to identify different parts because they're just, they're, they're into all of the shapes and the colors and all of that great stuff, that's what we want. So I'm going to show you some ways, some ways to extend those dissections a little bit more. But before I show them to you, because I've got a camera set up with some things I want to show you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about recording. Now, um, recording can be really simple in preschool. I what I would love is for everyone to frame writing down what you've learned, either in drawings or um, with words as your students get older, is huge. That's what scientists have to do. So you can use things like, you know, this little science journal here. This one is actually available through Becker's. You can just use paper. You can take photographs. There is not a preschooler now who does not know how to take a picture on a phone or a tablet. So they can do that too. But so there's the recording piece of it. But what I'd love everyone to do is make sure we do the second part of recording in science, which is sharing your knowledge. Okay, the journal and the pictures don't mean anything to a scientist unless you're sharing that knowledge, you're passing that knowledge on. That way, everyone can learn together and we're not sort of redoing experiments, it's general science, like in the scientific community, we're not redoing experiments and that sort of thing. So recording, how you record is completely up to you. But the idea that you are taking notes so that you can share that information is huge. So let's talk a little bit about how to get some of that information. So I'm going to switch to my little camera here. All right. Now, uh, those of you uh, panelists, if you can't see it, someone please let me know. But you should be able to see now what's next to me at my table here. So these are very simple sorting mats. Now you may have used um, things like this when, either when you're sorting with colors at the math station, um, or uh, you, you may have even like laminated a, a, a pumpkin diagram and so they could put all of their pieces where they belong. Those are all great. But I wanna show you some alternatives that can extend your children's learning with um, dissections, especially with fall things. Now I've got a lot of these and I'm going to share a couple of them with you right now. Um, and then in the winter and the um, uh, spring, I'll, I'll share a couple more of them when we dissect other things that are done that season. So all it is is a piece of paper inside one of these dry erase pockets. You can laminate them. I like the pockets because you can switch them out and um, you can like add and subtract and all, all that great stuff. So um, I have them in, in several different categories. The one here that's here on top is one of my measurement um, sorting mats. Now I'm going to show you these mats. It's you're going to have to, of course, introduce them to your students. There are words on them. They're mostly for you. I wouldn't necessarily put the words on there um, unless it was a, a signal to the adults who are working with the children. Um, I put the words on there so you can sort of see what I was going for with them. Um, you'll need to introduce them. And what's great about these particular sorting mats is they're not content specific. And um, they allow you to do multiple dissections with the same um, object or same um, uh, specimen. Okay, because we all know in preschool, one touch point is fine, five touch points is much better. Okay, so if they've got multiple experiences with something, um, the, the, the retention, obviously, as you know, is huge. 
So uh, bees allow the um, dissections to be more than a cut it open and look inside scenario. So each day they can uh, arrange the things they've dissected into different categories. So like for example here, I've got one of my measurement ones. So I've got this line up here. The idea is you've got a pile of leaves that you brought in. So I've got all of my sort of junk over here that I pulled out of my backyard right before I came in today. Um, and so they'll pull things out of there like this leaf. Okay, so I got my leaf. And then they get used to a procedure. So they place the leaf on that little line and they say, is it shorter, the same, or longer? And this is shorter, so I'm gonna move it over to shorter. Okay, and then you keep doing it with all of the things in your pile. Like this one right here, it's obviously much longer than my line. So I would move it over to my longer section. Now this is wipeable. You can, you can wipe it you know, at, at the end of um, each student using it. It's also dry erase so they can make notes on it. They can draw pictures on it if they'd like. Um, and it's just a really easy way to sort of get into that, that uh, habit of measuring and then measuring and comparing. If three sections is too much for your students, if you're like, you just gotta do bigger or smaller, do bigger or smaller. That's why I just hand draw it because I can change it on the fly if the, the, the three sort of designations is just too much. So I can change that. So that's one way that you can use um, one of these mats. Let me show you my next one. This one's one of my favorites. All right, so we're gonna use this one to um, sort of categorize what we've dissected sort of by the process. So the idea here is that we're going to look at an object whole first, okay? In this case, we're doing some beautiful mums. So we're gonna look at the object whole first and we're gonna put it right there. We're gonna make all of our observations. You can even write it on here if you'd like, um, but we're looking at it whole. Then we're going to take a similar object. In this case, like you wouldn't do this with a pumpkin because you're not gonna have a million pumpkins to dissect, but something like mum flowers, you can do, um, you could have multiples of them. So for the second area, you're gonna just break it into two pieces. Now make observations. How is it different? How has it changed from whole to sort of half here? And then of course, I've got a third mum and we've got all of the pieces there, okay? And now we can look at each individual piece of our object and make comparisons. How is it different than when it was whole, halved, and in all sorts of little pieces? Now, what's neat about this, and by the way, just fun fact about mums that I learned while I was preparing for this webinar, is this is not a single flower, okay? When you're looking at a mum, that's not a single flower. This little guy right here, is actually a single flower. And there are two types of flowers in each individual sort of mum floof. I'm gonna call it a mum floof. That's not a technical term, don't use floof, but eh, you get it. So uh, in each of these, there are hundreds of individual flowers and two different types. There's the long ones that look like petals. And then if you look in the center of the mum, there are these tiny little ones that are called disc flowers. So you've got ray flowers, which are the, um, uh, things that look like petals. And then we've got disc flowers, which are the ones in the middle. So cool. And you can see it really easily when you start putting out the different uh, pieces of the flower like that. And then I wanna show you one more. Now I know you sort by color. Colors are big <laughs> in preschool. Sorting by color becomes problematic when you are dissecting natural things like a pumpkin. Because when you get to a pumpkin, I got my little pumpkin that I've already sort of pre-dissected here for you. Um, everything's orange for the most part. So a really sort of cheap and easy way around that um, is just going to your local hardware store and uh, gathering up all of those sort of free paint chips. Okay, because now I've set the stage for some really deep observations because now orange has lots of options to it. So I can take this part of the pumpkin, sort of the, the fleshy part in the middle, and I can say, mm, it's lighter than that, but it matches that color right there. And I can take the seeds and I can do the same thing. I can find where it goes. You can see it doesn't have to be neatly organized. If for you, you'd rather have them all laid out really nicely. You can laminate them and make them really pretty. I'm 
as you probably guessed, a little more sort of all over the place. Um, but it allows you to, to really hone in on the different uh, colors and textures you see in natural things. So if you had a rainbow, it'd be really hard to classify this pumpkin because we've got, you know, two or three colors and everything would go in orange for the most part. Um, so this is, this is a neat way of um, allowing for some um, of those finer distinctions and really inviting your students to look really closely at what they've dissected. And last but not least, this is my favorite, but it is some of the hardest to work with. Ta-da! A blank one. <laughs> um, it's, so if, if you go back to that uh, standards page, you will have seen um, that uh, ha allowing the students to make their own sort of designations as they're making observations and things like that, it's huge. So giving them a blank sorting sheet, allowing them to sort um, by their own sort of uh, designations is really big. It's a hard skill. Um, I've done it with, you know, high schoolers and I nearly had a mutiny when I didn't give them the, the specifications that they needed to sort with. So um, it's a hard one. But if you introduce it early, the students will get used to the idea that they can sort of sort based on their own um, uh, stipulations, rules, organization. And that's a really, really big deal. All right. So I hope you were able to find something in this discussion of um, dissections uh, that, that can hopefully uh, make your dissections in your classroom a little more, uh, not only hands-on, but definitely more, um, have, have a longer extension time, which is huge when you're in preschool. Okay. All right. So I want to show you a really neat experiment that you can do in your classroom. You're going to get the step-by-step -step instructions for this um, at the end. Um, they'll be available on uh, the website. This recording will be available. So you don't need to write down all of the steps. But if you do want to play along and you've gotten these things with me, uh, we've gotten these things ahead of time, you are more than welcome to play along and, and share what it looks like in the, in the chat. We'd be happy to see it. Um, but we're going to do a little experiment that demonstrates how leaves change color in the fall. Now, this is really important if you live in a place where leaves don't change color. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back to my little camera here in just a second. I'm going to flip back and forth. Give me one second to change it. Okay, oh, that's just me. All right, here we go. Fantastic. So I've got my little camera here and we're going to do an experiment. Now, uh, some of you may have done um, what's called chromatography in your classroom. And that's where you take a marker and you uh, draw on it, preferably a black marker, and you uh, stick it in water. And as the water goes up the coffee filter, the uh, colors separate out. It's called chromatography and it's a really neat experiment. I have a little bit of a different take on that today to use in a fall unit. So the first thing you'll wanna do is give each student half a coffee filter. Now you can have them trace leaves, you can have them just draw leaves from memory. Um, I like the tracing leaves because it's also an observation built in. It gives them a chance to look even more closely at the things that they have gathered. Um, but the first step is to trace it with a black washable marker really important you use a black washable marker first. I'll explain why in a second. And then after that, they can go ahead and color it in with a green marker, washable, not Sharpie. Sharpie's a bad idea. And then ultimately what you're gonna do is I've got a cup here. I got a glass that has some vinegar in it, okay? And I got a little clothespin up here to help me so my little co coffee filter doesn't fall in. So you're gonna take your coffee filter and you're gonna clip it to the top of your cup. Give me one second, oh, I'm sorry. It didn't fold over quite as nicely as I wanted it to. And you're gonna dip it so that just the end is in the uh, vinegar, okay? Now it's really important you use vinegar. I'll explain why in a second. But now is the time for predictions and observations. So as you're introducing this to your student, you say, this is a green leaf. It's a green leaf, just like the leaves in the summertime are green. 
okay? So now we're gonna leave that there and we'll come back and look at it in a little bit, but it's already started to change. Okay, so as the vinegar goes up the coffee filter paper, the green and the um, uh, blues in the marker will start to travel up right away. So we're gonna leave that and we'll come back to it in a second, but I wanna talk a little bit about uh, why these sorts of things happen, why leaves change color and why this experiment works. Okay, let's go back to my little PowerPoint there. Fantastic. Okay, so why do leaves change color in the fall? <laughs> Why does that happen? So um, when leaves are green, they're filled with something called chlorophyll, which I'm sure you've heard of before. And that's how the plant makes its own food. Okay, so that, that, that chlorophyll is really, really green. And during the spring and the summer, when the tree's making lots of food for itself and it's growing and it's all, all, there's a lot of sunlight for it to use during photosynthesis to, to eat its food, um, that green is there. That's all you can really see. Now in the fall, as the days get shorter, the tree starts preparing for less and less light. And so that chlorophyll starts to break down. It's not making as much food. And when it breaks down, what actually starts to happen is you start to see other colors that were always present in the leaf. The leaf. So you, there was always yellow and orange in that leaf. You just couldn't see it because all the chlorophyll was there. So as that chlorophyll breaks down, you start to see those other colors show up. Now, sometimes colors like red, like you see on my little chart there, um, red um, is, is actually, a, a, happens because of the chlorophyll breaking down. It wasn't always there, but through the chlorophyll breaking down, there's a chemical reaction that gives us that bright red color. So that's why generally leaves start to change color in the fall. Now the experiment we're doing, this is, uh, is a demonstration. <laughs> it's not, you know, the actual science of how a uh, leaf changes color. You can do that. Now, there is a way to pull the chlorophyll and all the other pigments from a leaf and do what we're doing with our markers with the actual pigments from the leaf. Problem with that is, is it's very, very subtle and it takes a while and sometimes you need to add heat to it all of which does not make it a great demonstration for the preschool classroom. Um, so what we're doing here um, is, is sort of a, a, a faster preschool version to show sort of the same ideas. The idea that the green is there when you see a green leaf, the green goes away and is, a new color is revealed. That's really what we're getting at here with this demonstration. Um, so I'm gonna let it sit for a little bit longer before I show you what uh, that that reveal really looks like um, and why we used vinegar. Um, but in the resources for the activities you're going to be getting today, you will have a link to the, the sort of the real leaf chromatography. So you can actually pull those colors out. Maybe you want to do it before uh, your class so you can show the students. It's completely up to you. But this preschool friendly version really hits at the main idea of the green goes away and reveals these bright new colors. Um, here, actually, let me, let me show you. I've, mine started working for those of you who are not following along at home. Let me show you my, how it looks on my end. So you can see here that it's already started to travel up and it's taking that green and that blue with it. I'm gonna try and see if I can bring it closer. I don't know if that actually helps. But as the green and the blue move up, the uh, coffee filter, you'll actually notice that there's a little bit of orange and red that's left behind. That is why we're using um, vinegar and not water. If we were using water, basically all of the cover colors would sort of, sort of travel up generally around the same time. They wouldn't really start separating until the top of your page, at uh, the top of your filter. Since we're using vinegar, for whatever reason, I, I don't know why this is, <laughs> but the red and orange pigments in our green, or in, in our um, black marker, don't really get dissolved by the vinegar. 
So they sort of get left behind. So what we're going to end up with is sort of this like ghostly image of our first leaf, but it'll be red and orange. So it's showing how um, that red and orange was always there, but wasn't shown until the green was dissolved from our, our little marker leaf here. So again, more of a demonstration. It's not actually the science of why leaves change color, but it's a fast way for students to sort of get that idea that those, those fall colors were always there in their leaf. All right. So that's my sort of first hands-on experiment. Please let us know if you think this is something that you would do in your classroom. All right, so um, as we go forward with these seasonal science workshops, I need to know what you're gonna use in your classroom. So if you can fill out this uh, next poll about how likely you are to use this, this um, marker leaf transformation, how do leaves change color in the fall in your classroom, let us know so that I can um, get, there you go, perfect. So I can get your feedback and, and I can use it to um, figure out what sorts of activities you're most looking forward to uh, at, the, at future uh, webinars. All right, so while you're working on that, oh, books. Books are my, I just, I, I, science is my passion, but I do love books. And that's why I've, I've, I've spent more time as a reading specialist more, more recently. I do love books. So let's talk about books for the fall. I got lots of suggestions, lots of the great ideas. Okay, so the first, I want to talk about nonfiction books. Now, I came from a science background, so um, nonfiction was sort of the deal. You know, we were always talking about being honest with our science. So here's my deal. I love nonfiction books, but I don't love them. Ooh, people are, okay, so good. So the, the results are people are, 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 are psyched about our leaves change color. That's good. So I'll keep that in mind as we move forward. So for nonfiction books, um, I like them in the classroom. I don't love them as read alouds. I really don't love them as read alouds. Um, I think they're very important for students to have one-on-one -on -one access with them. They should always be around and they should always be able to be uh, accessed easily in the classroom in centers, small groups, those sorts of things. Send them home to talk with their parents about. But supplemental to story time is sort of key for me. Um, I, I don't like to use them for story times. I feel like many of them were not written very, um, they were not written for story time. <laughs> so how do you choose them? So I would um, look for a selection of both illustrated and photographs. Now, the photograph books are, are fantastic, but there are things you can do in illustrations, like there you can um, distort um, uh, the, the actual organism or animal in a way that makes it more easily understood. So don't only stick to the photograph ones. They, they seem like they would be like the most sort of um, um, scientific, but include some illustrations because it allows the, the illustrators able to just sort things in a way that makes it easy for preschoolers to understand. Look for diagrams, numbers, time-lapse image, images, because you don't know what's going to resonate with your students unless you give them all of those options at once. So include books that they can't read yet and books that you would never read to them because there are great pictures and diagrams and great things that maybe a, an early childhood author wouldn't have put in their book, but is perfectly great to talk about with your classroom. It's just maybe written in a way that, that's sort of above their level. So put it in there. And you're gonna find mistakes. So you find a mistake, you tape over it and write the right answer in. So I, <laughs> I love to use the very hungry caterpillar um, when I was teaching about you know, the butterfly life cycle. And now obviously that's not a nonfiction book, that is a fiction book. So correct books all around. <laughs> um, but I, at, the, at the end of the book, it talks about how the butterfly made his cocoon. And I went, oh, butterflies don't make cocoons. They make something called a chrysalis. So I just, you know, took a little piece of paper and I wrote chrysalis on it and I taped it in my book, nice and secure. And every time a student, got the book, they're like, what, what is this? What is this word? Because it looked different. It was just handwritten in there. And so every time we got to have a discussion about the word chrysalis, and they're not gonna forget that word because it's so different from the rest of the book. And again, it gives you a chance to talk about it's okay to be wrong. So the book's fine, just correct it. 
don't get rid of, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If the book is great, it's got wonderful pictures and wonderful diagrams, but something's not right, just tape over it, correct it yourself. And then um, some ways to use nonfiction books beyond sort of just having them out in your centers. Um, I love using post-it questions. So basically it's just a post-it, a, a pad of post-its that you have just drawn question marks on. And you put it at your science center or in your library, um, wherever it sort of fits in with what you're doing in your classroom. And anytime a student is reading independently or working in a small group and they've got a question, they should just stick it in the book. And they, you'd fill up the books with all these questions so that when it comes time to read maybe a, a fiction book about a similar topic, you can bring that book out and be like, oh, someone had a question about this. Let's talk about it. That's a really interesting thing. Let's talk about it. And so it gives you the chance to sort of control when you're having those conversations, but allows them to engage a little more deeply with the books that are sort of strewn about the classroom. Um, of course, I spy huge in nonfiction books, especially those photographs, the ones that have lots of photographs in them. Make your own books. I'm sure a lot of you are already doing this and then have things out that they can actually draw on and interact with. Okay, so here are some great suggestions for books. Now, some of these are actually found in the Becker's Seasonal Science, um, so, um, Seasonal Real, I'll, I'll get the name right at the end. <laughs> There's a big slide, so I'll get the name right at the end. So for example, those first three, um, they're great examples of books that you just wanna have out all fall long. You, you want students to be seeing them in the science center, in, in the library, you want to bring them to small groups. Even if you're not reading them directly, you want them around because they'll frame a lot of the conversations you have about the science um, of fall as you're moving through. And you can see I've got other great ones that are, are, are illustrations. You can see I've, I've taken pictures out of some of them. So you can see the um, pumpkin circle. You can see that really close up photography down there in the bottom left hand corner. That's a great um, piece of it because we're not bringing microscopes into our classrooms, but the books allow us to take those up close looks. Um, and then I like the How Do Apples Grow by Jill McDonald there at the bottom. Very, very simple diagrams. They're not accurate sort of size-wise or even, even necessarily um, proportions, but that's okay because it gets the student thinking about all of those different layers and uh, again the, the actual proportions in science, we're not worried about that right now. We're, we're trying to inspire that sort of deeper looking and, and, and that you can get from a book like How Do Apples Grow? All right, so I've got another quickie demo demonstration to show you of uh, something you can do in your classroom because I'm, I'm talking and I'm going much more slowly than I thought I was going to be going. Um, so I wanna show you two different sort of building challenges that you can do in your classroom. Because we all know that sort of this hands-on maker space is, is not going anywhere with good reason. It's a really, really good skill for students to start learning uh, very, very early on. The idea that you're given some, um, some ingredients or you're given some supplies and you've got to build something out of that. So to do a little sort of fall take on that, I'm going to move that back and we're going to, I'm going to show you really, really quick on my camera what I'm talking about. Okay, great. So now for those of you who are not doing this at home, I'm going to leave this up here. You can still see, you can see even more of that leaf is now there. So it's, you've got some red and we've got some orange in there. I'm going to leave it back there so by the end we can get a closer look. So the very first one is some um, apple tree building. Now apple trees are funny looking trees. If you actually look at them, I would suggest spending some time to look at apple trees. But for this one, basically you're giving them sticks. They're going to put the branches on and then as another great fine motor skill uh, practice, you can start adding apples to your tree. Now what's important is that you're asking lots of questions as this is going on. How many branches did you use? How did you decide where to put the branches? How did you decide where to put the apples? Does it look like an apple tree you've seen in person? So as they're building, asking these questions as you go along, again, if you look at the standards, that's really all we need to be doing is we need to be scaffolding these conversations around very sort of simple building mechanics. Another one you can do um, is, uh, hold on, let me go back to my, to my little PowerPoint here. Because the second one, is you can literally just give them supplies. Give them popsicle sticks, give them Play-Doh, give them a plate and say, build a tree. 
Now, before this, it really helps to spend some time looking at the shapes of trees because not all trees look the same. When we draw trees, they tend to be sort of that fluffy tree on the top and then the, then the um, um, trunk. Couldn't think of the word trunk. There we go. Um, so they all sort of look the same when we end up drawing them. But really, when you look at sort of how trees are laid out, they, they all look very, very different. So this is a great one to do after you spend some time going on a nature walk, looking at trees on the internet. And there's some great ways to explore the shape of trees in the resources attached to this presentation. So definitely check that out. So I um, learned a lot about apple trees <laughs> while I was preparing for this. Uh, apple trees are the shape they are because we've made them that shape. Naturally, they would not be uh, that shape, but we really wanted to get the most apples out of our trees. So we pruned them and bred them to sort of be this weird sort of short squat wide tree so we could get the apples and get really, really big apples. So I thought that was kind of interesting and it could be a neat way to talk to your students about why the trees look the way they do and how, how we can impact those shapes. And then while you're building trees, spend some time on some weird trees. Now I know we're talking about fall specifically and we're talking about balancing with our leaves and all that great stuff, but spend some time talking about trees where there, there may not be a fall <laughs> the same way that there is um, with the trees that we're uh, traditionally talking about. So here are some really great examples of some very odd trees. Look them up. There's some crazy stuff going on here. <laughs> so uh, take a peek at some neat um, uh, different trees from around the world as you're building your trees and, and getting the sort of the balance worked out. All right. So I want to know how likely you are to use sort of those tree building activities. Um, see if these engineering uh, activities are something that you might want to do in your classroom. And again, you'll have step-by-step -step instructions on how to do these uh, at the end of the uh, webinar. You'll have it all sent to you. So take a few seconds to fill that out. All right. <clears throat> Back to books. Oh, I love books so much. <laughs> And the fiction books are my favorite. So I was sort of a bit of a black sheep at, um, at, as, a, as a science educator because I love fiction books to teach science. And there's so much science wrong with fiction books. And, and one of my favorite, favorite, favorite books to teach about dinosaurs had dinosaurs and people living together, which is like rule number one when you're teaching dinosaurs, they didn't live together. But I just, I loved the idea of the conversations that you could get from um, using fiction books in a science classroom. So I'm gonna share some ways to use fiction to really get at the science. Thank you for filling out that poll. It looks like the engineering activities are things that you might be using. Glad to hear it. All right, so let's talk about fiction books. So you're reading lots of fiction books already in your classroom. Sometimes all it takes is a tweak of the way that you question students while you're reading them to make them really, really great for teaching science concepts, okay? Um, I found that realistic settings and plots are more important than realistic characters. Bring on the talking bears. It's gonna be okay. We know bears don't talk in real life and that's okay. But if those bears are living in a really interesting place and we can see other animals that live with them and we can see the plants that live around them. And even if those plants talk, we are still getting a really great snapshot of an environment that we can talk about beyond the story. So don't be afraid to use talking animals in your science curriculum, okay? And those are in my mind, for my money, are some of the best ways to start conversations. Pick ridiculous ones. I love them. You can have really great conversations. It's all about how you frame them in your classroom. And then um, again, pair with those, those nonfiction books. That's the best way to sort of get the, the, the students thinking about it as deeply as possible and ask questions of the students the entire time. Okay. Now I want to share some fiction books that I think are particularly great here. Now, something I didn't mention on, on the last slide that was written there was look for characters who are curious. Look for characters who change their mind about something. Again, I know I sound like a broken record, 
but I, I especially sort of now, <laughs> it's really important for people to, to for, for kids to think about how being wrong isn't a problem when it comes to science. So as you're reading those fiction books, try to pick ones where the, where the characters learn a big lesson and you'll even get more out of it than sort of the content piece of it. So I've got great books here. They're all fantastic. Now some lean more towards the nonfiction, like the ones by Kennard Pack in the uh, top left corner there. They're a little more nonfiction-y um, than uh, some of the other ones like Stumpkin, which is about like an anthropomorphized pumpkin, um, which is, is a very cute one. But uh, you can see all the ones at the bottom have some of those um, piece of, pieces of the puzzle that I was talking about, like Sophie Squatch, which is also in that um, seasonal science pack that I was telling you about before. Uh, the really great thing about that is she goes to someone at the farmer's market to learn more about the squash. Okay, so not only are you learning about the life cycle of a squash in this book, and it's, it's such a cute one if you haven't read it. It's about a little girl who basically adopts a squash as like her doll baby and like carries it around until of course the squash is, you know, no good anymore. <laughs> so it's a great sort of um, life cycle book. But what I love is that it gives you the opportunity to talk about, well, Sophie didn't know enough about her squash, so she went and asked someone about it. And that's huge, okay? It's huge in science to be able to realize, I don't know what I need to know. I've got to find out and I've got to talk to other people. So you can sort of ingrain all of these great science ideas and behaviors with some really great fiction books while you're teaching about the life cycle of a squash. And, um, you know, Leaf Trouble is another great one. It's a, it's a character who's, who's trying to like put the leaves back on the tree. And then, you know, he, he tries lots of different things to put the, the leaves back on the tree because he wants them to go back on. And so it's a really great idea that, you, uh, that um, persistence in experimentation really, really pays off. So I really wanted to show you this whole fantastic book. <laughs> this is a brand new fiction book called The Very Last Leaf by Steph Wade. Now, um, I unfortunately am running out of time and cannot show you the entire book as much as I want to. Um, I, but I will sort of share a little bit with you here. All right, let me make this nice and big so you can see it. So I can give you a sense of how you can ask questions during a fiction story to um, uh, really sort of get at the science and get at some of those things I was talking about. So this book is, is absolutely adorable. It's, it's about a, a little leaf who um, is just so great at everything except for falling off his tree because he's a little scared of it. So um, for example, this is how I would read this page um, as sort of a science focused read aloud, okay? From his first day of school in the spring, Lance Cottonwood was the best and brightest student. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who's Lance Cottonwood? Who, who on this page do you think is Lance Cottonwood? He's a leaf. Oh my goodness. Do leaves really talk and go to school? No, they don't, but we're gonna pretend so we can learn lots and lots and lots about how a leaf lives, okay? So he blossomed in budding, blossomed. I love that word, have you heard that word before? Yeah, like flower blossoms, but you know what? Leaves can blossom too, out of a bud. And he says, look at me, I'm a leaf. He was really, really good at coming out of his bud. He breathed through wind resistance. Oh, wind, can we make wind in our classroom, can we do this? Can you pretend you're a leaf and you're stuck to your branch? Yeah, because leaves don't want to fall off all the time. Do they, when do leaves want to fall off their tree? In the fall. So they want to hang on to that branch until they need to fall off in the fall. So he's really good at it. He's says, better luck next time. He was a fresh, fresh air in photosynthesis 101. Photosynthesis. Oh, I love that word. I love it. Can you say it with me? Photosynthesis. Oh, you know what? Does anyone know what that word means? I read this book before and I had to look up what that word means. And it's the way that a tree makes their own food. Now, do you make your own food? Now, I'm not talking about making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You need to eat food to get energy. Plants don't. They make their own food from the 
sun. How do we know that uh, Lance Cottonwood in our, in our little picture over there is, uh, is out in the sun? <laughs> He's got little sunglasses on. He's picking up all that sunlight. Don't you just love the taste of sunlight in the morning? And he passed pigment changing with flying colors. Pigment change. How does he look different now? How does Lance Cottonwood look different now? <laughs> He's orange. He's a completely different color. Wow. Have you ever seen a leaf do that? Yes. When does that happen? In the fall. And you get the idea. So great, great fiction story that uh, can allow us to talk a lot about um, uh, sort of the, the, the science behind why leaves change color. Definitely check this book out. It is adorable. It's brand new. Um, and I, I think it would fit well into most of your classroom conversations about fall. All right. Whew. Home stretch. You're doing great. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is animals. Now, if you remember back to sort of that about me screen, you saw me holding lots of crazy animals. I believe I had a cockatoo in one and a, and a bearded dragon in the other. I love animals. And working with animals is one of the best things I've ever done in my whole life. So kids also love talking about animals. So let's chat a little bit about some ways you can talk about what animals do in the fall in your classroom. Okay, so animals do lots of different things. For those of you in the South, it's your time to shine because lots of animals, of course, go to warmer climates. Now, not all animals that migrate, of course, go all the way down to uh, what we consider sort of the South here in the United States. They may only go one or two states South. So the first thing animals can do is they can fly South. I suggest playing follow the leader as geese in your classroom. It's adorable. Trust me. So there are some, um, some tips there to uh, play uh, flying south in your classroom. What else can an animal do in the fall? Gather food. Huge. Okay. Now animals will gather food and they'll do one of two things with it. Okay. So they'll eat it. So if you're paying attention to, uh, uh, what is it, the, the fat bear Olympics right now, basically, I think it's called that. Uh, people are just watching the bears get bigger and bigger and bigger. So they're eating it because what are they going to do? They're going to hibernate. So they're actually not going to go out and get a lot of food during the winter. So they're consuming all of their calories now and putting on those fat layers that they're going to work off of as they're sleeping and, and resting through the winter. Or they can gather it and store it. So smaller animals typically tend to do this, things like chipmunks and tree squirrels. So they're not going to be able to eat enough food to sort of sleep through the winter, and they don't really sleep through the winter anyway. So they're gathering it and putting it aside. I suggest a really fun sort of scavenger hunt game where the students have a chance to do both of those things. So your squirrels and your chipmunks have to gather food in a basket and put it in another basket. Your bears and your um, uh, groundhogs, would they, they have to eat the food. So I would suggest putting on a little backpack in the front and letting them put their food inside there so their bellies get nice and big and round. So you can sort of pantomime and, and play um, these two sort of different animal reactions to the fall. And then the last thing, which is usually not in its own, it's usually a as to the gather food sort of behavior of animals um, in the fall is build a warm den. And this gives us another chance to really get into that open-ended engineering, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip back to my camera to show you my little den activity. Give me just one second. There it is, oh, and there's our leaf. Fantastic, you can see our leaf now is even more red and orange just like the leaves in the fall. <laughs> now again, this is a demonstration that's not actually, there's no vinegar that is uh, involved in leaves turning uh, in the fall, but it's a great preschool size demonstration of how leaves change color. All right, so we're gonna build a little den here. So this is, this is a great sort of build your own engineering open-ended um, uh, chance. So what I suggest doing is um, taping basically a plastic cup to a plate like this, and this is gonna be the den. This is gonna be where your animal's gonna spend the really, really cold winter. So the first thing I would have you do, unfortunately I put my, uh, my uh, uh, ice pack that I'm gonna be using in a second on top of it, so it's gonna mess it up a little bit, is if you have students who are old enough to sort of recognize 
sort of temperature. I know you're all doing your um, weathers, weather in your, in your classroom. You can use one of these little digital thermometers and take sort of take the temperature inside your den. And then, you know, chart it to winter. Put an ice pack on top of your den. Take the temperature again. Add some nice warm stuff inside. Take the temperature again. And then put it underground by putting a piece of Play-Doh between the den and the ice pack. This is a really mashed up version of what it was going to look like, but we're running out of time. So uh, again, step-by-step -step directions are in there. So you can really mess around with all of these pieces and um, talk about how animals are working to build these dens um, to keep themselves warm. Okay. Da -da -da. And there were the things we just talked about. Uh, the, you know, gathering food to eat it, gathering it to store it, and then migrating some information. So, I know I blew through the autumn animal antics. I didn't even get to make, I didn't even get to say that, and I love uh, alliteration. It's my favorite thing. But uh, how likely are you to do either the, the goose um, flying south for the winter game, or the gathering the food game with the little backpacks in the front, or building your own den? Go ahead and let us know. All right. We made it, everybody. We are ready for fall science. <laughs> Again, there's going to be lots of additional resources and information available um, at the, uh, in, in, of course, in this recording and as part of a blog posts and activity guide that will be made available. Um, Miss Kathy. Oh, there we go. Oh, they like these too. Fantastic. Miss Kathy. Hello. So, um, would you like to talk a little bit more about um, what's on this wonderful slide right here? Absolutely. So, thank you, Holly. That was so informative. I've learned so much about fall that I now I need to go outside as soon as we're done and, and experiment a little bit and explore. Um, so, Holly shared uh, activities with you, and from the chat, it sounds like everyone is going into school tomorrow and to do the leaf vinegar activity. Um, so they're really excited about that one. Um, and some uh, supplies, resources that you might uh, want to put into your classroom. That was one, another question somebody had, what, what can I put in my classroom? So these are some uh, materials that are available at Becker's. Um, can't go wrong with the magnifying glass um, from toddlers all the way through adults. Um, so Becker's has a lot of resources that um, you could take a look at. The journals, the science journal is great for kids to be able to record, um, to, uh, they can draw, they can write. Um, Holly has a great example there. Um, like that has graph paper in it too. That's awesome. Yes. So it, it, it's for science, then you connect it with math and literacy as always. Um, there are... Uh, this is one set of books, and if Holly, if you advance, you will see. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the, yes, there we go. Yep. That's what I've been talking about. There it is. The Seasonal Storytime book set. So this is a great, it's a huge book set that covers all the seasons. Um, so um, this is something you definitely want to check out on our website, uh, shopbeckers.com. So uh, there, I know people are heading out. Um, but I just want to remind you, this is the first in a series. And guess what? There are four total because there are four seasons. So uh, we will have another science webinar um, later in the year that will cover winter, um, which will be also just as exciting and engaging um, as this one was today. Um, so there were, uh, you will receive um, a, a copy of the recording and uh, the list of the activities and resources um, and other supporting resources that you can use. Um, someone was getting ready to uh, talk about trees. So this fit in exactly with their tree study with the creative curriculum. It's a, a great connection there. It is fall. Um, so everyone you know, was really excited to be able to jump in and just get started. So, Again, Holly, thank you very much uh, for another great webinar. <laughs> and everyone, thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you again in our web, uh, winter webinar. 
um, and you will be receiving your uh, professional development certificate and a copy of the recording and all the supporting materials as well. So have and a great afternoon. If you're doing afternoon. your classroom, take pictures and send them because we'd love to see them. <laughs> yes, please. If you're doing the experiments, um, send them to us so we can, um, you know, share them with others. Um, everyone was sharing ideas in the chat in the Q and A box. So uh, definitely uh, do this. Take some photos, send them to us, um, and share. So go enjoy the autumn day.